it was really hard to understand that something so phenomenal was happening right before your eyes. It was really hard to process coming around the corner and seeing the back spray of a wave exactly the same shape as the front of the wave going 100 feet in the air. It was really hard to process pulling into the lineup and looking at this wave top to bottom 30, 40 feet and no one there. Mm -hmm. It's really hard process to go, you go. No, you go. No, you go. And so that being said, it, it was the, definitely the peak in our lives. Strap crew, my life, Laird, Buzzy, it was like we were climbing Everest. Mm -hmm. It was going to be the peak of our lives, and everything after that was just going to be easy. That's Derek Dorner. I'm Jamie Brissick. This is Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Howler Brothers, Outer Known, Patagonia, Rainbow Sandals, Vans, and Yeti. More like a book than a magazine, The Journal delivers 136 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. To learn more and to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. This episode of Soundings is presented by Costa Sunglasses. If you're anything like me and you spend lots of time around the water, then you know just how important it is to have a good pair of shades. And since 1983, when a group of intrepid outdoorsmen set out to make sunglasses that could stand up to the harsh environments they regularly encountered, Costa remains the choice in eyewear among those committed to life on the water. So whether you're diving in, climbing aboard, suiting up, sliding one, leaning back, or all the above, head to costadelmar.com to grab your pair and to see what's out there. Derek Dorner, a.k.a. Double D, is a big wave hellman, toe surfing pioneer, Hollywood stuntman, and former North Shore lifeguard. He grew up surfing in the L.A. area in the 1960s and 70s, moved to Hawaii his senior year of high school, and discovered himself joyous and at peace in waves that send most of us running for the hills. He lifeguarded at sunset in Waimea Bay, which furthered his intimacy with both of those hallowed breaks. I got to watch Derek surfing big Waimea in the 80s and 90s. He liked to slot himself in the heaviest position on the heaviest of waves, cannonballing down beyond vertical walls so tall they'd make him look almost ant-sized. In person, his face and gaze reflect all that daring stuff in the water. Think Clint Eastwood as the man with no name. Hungry for waves too big to catch manually, Derek and his pals Laird Hamilton and Buzzy Kerbox started experimenting with personal watercraft assists in the early 1990s. Not long after, they found Pia'i, a.k.a. Jaws. So began toe surfing. In Hollywood, Derek stunt doubled for Bodhi, Patrick Swayze's character, in 1991's Point Break, and appeared as a stunt surfer in the 2002 James Bond film Die Another Day, among many others. Derek and I spoke at his shop in the old Wailua Sugar Mill on Oahu, which is as much a museum as it is a functioning board building factory. Behind us was the late Dick Brewer's Shaping Bay. Tools and notes and pencil sketchings all there, just as he left them. Derek's boards were scattered around the room, rhino chasers and tow boards, all invoking monster waves. So Derek, happy to have you on the show. Well, thank you. Um, I was reading a story about you, and you were talking about when you were a kid, you lived on the beach at Trancas, and your dad had either a bell or a whistle, and he would let you know when the sets are coming in. Can you talk ab about those early days? And your, I guess your dad was a lifeguard as well, yeah? Yeah, my father was um, uh, Victor Lucky Dorner. Um, he was a waterman. Um, he uh, was an outdoorsman, remarkable diver. And along his path, he acquired a piece of property in Malibu 
um, just south of point zero. Mm -hmm. And it was Trancus Point, and it's called um, the Chusa Point. Yep. And at that time, there were very few homes at the point. Matter of fact, there were none. Um, and he built his dream home right at the Chusa Point. And it's still there as we speak. Unfortunately, you can't really see it because there's 30 other homes there, but I just saw it last week. Um, that being said, there was a, a small group of surfers, you know, the, the, the Pipers and the Pritchetts and the, um, the Broyles, Marcus Broyles, and um, my dad had the beach house, and so um, we were blessed with um, Trancus Beach. And when the water was really clear, there was no marine layer outside, and it was just like a glass bottle, and you could see the Corbinas, and uh, President Reagan lived down the street, and we used to throw dirt clogs at him with two Secret Service guys. And my, my dad was a diver, mm -hmm. and uh, he would dive the outer reef there, and he'd come in with abalones and lobsters, and I mean, it, was, it was a good life. Along that path, my mom lived at Big Rock, and um, I caught my first wave pretty much at point zero in Big Rock. And then on the weekends, I'd do a separation with my mom and dad. I'd visit my dad. And lo and behold, I was blessed upon Lachusa Point, which is a really good wave in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. My dad had this big bell on the porch. And when he would see a set coming, he would ring the bell. Little did I know it was going to create a monster. Um, so I started going from the beach break to the outer reef there. There was a big rock pile there, and it would break out there. And if you were good, you could time it right where you could catch it from that outside and ride it all the way in past the rock to the Piper house. And so one day I was out there and riding the beach break, and it was connecting from the outside to the inside, and my dad was ringing the bell. And I somehow I paddle out there on this Marcus Broyles surfboard with the hand sign on it and um, got into a wave and I could still remember the rush of the wind and the waves and just riding it all the way through the beach. And as I said before, um, that's, where, that's where it started, right there. You know, so I grew up in, the, in pretty much the same area. I lived in the valley, but I surfed those same breaks. And um, when I first came to the North Shore to ride big waves, it was, it was a big slap upside the head in terms of the difference between the soft waves of LA County and the real waves over here. What, at what point did you sort of realize you had a taste for bigger, heavy water? Well, at that time, um, I got the taste right then where there were less people outside than there were inside. And it was the same thing where my mom lived down the street. There were more waves outside than inside. So it was just one of those things where um, I, I like to go where there was less people because I, I could surf the wave instead of surfing around people. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that surfing was going to be my whole life, mm -hmm. you know, because I was never one to sell uh, my soul. I was one to follow my heart and wherever it took me, um, I went. Um, Fortunately, I'm still surfing and I'm 67 years old, so that makes it 60, 63, or 62 years I've been surfing. Back in my days, you didn't really think about education or the future, which now can come back and bite you, which it has many times. That being said, though, I always was true to myself and I never sold my soul. Mm -hmm. Big waves was something that just started coming to me. Uh, fortunately for me, I started from the bottom of the ladder and very carefully worked my way up to a point where I could step into bigger waves. Um, but there was no spot in between that I bypassed. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of well-rounded, I had to go deck hand on my dad's fishing boat. I had to do my chores. Um, I had to work to surf. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't follow those rules, um, you know, I wouldn't be able to surf. And that's pretty much where it started. But you got to realize that 
Trancus Point all the way up to Point Zero is is a very sacred coastline. It's for the Chumash mm-hmm. um, lived long before we came in. You know, it's, Malibu is the most beautiful place in the world. It still is. And I think if you look at the name Malibu and you really dig down inside of it, Malibu, surfing, it became, it was the passage from the valley to the sea. And so the Chumash Indians would pass through the Malibu to go in the summer and fish and dive. And they lived along the coastline and the coastline was given the name Anarush. And it's still that. And that segment of coastline is still very, very private Mm -hmm. and beautiful. Yeah. And now I see that, of course, everywhere else is in the world Mm -hmm. um, is changing. But how do we do it? How do you do it? All we can do is smile because we lived the golden years. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, being from all over the world, my mom was... French and Spanish, so I lived in the Mediterranean, Marseille, je parle français très bien. And uh, my father was the um, avid waterman, and my stepfather, Don, was a very um, regimented businessman, very successful businessman. And so we just had to find places that it worked. And unfortunately, me being a surfer, like many people listening to this, understand that um, it's for life. Yeah, It's like Slater said, mafia, it's till you die. And mm-hmm. it's like Greg Knoll said, baby, all the way to the grave. And I'm still there. Yeah, And it has its uh, drawbacks, you know, with um, being able to make a substantial living. Um, for me, being a big wave rider then, there was no money in it. It was just extreme talent, big balls, and long swims. Mm-hmm. What year did you come to Hawaii, and how old were you at the time? Having been through a lot, moved all over the place, um, I broke s- some rules, and um, I broke some hearts that point I followed my heart and I ended up on the big island against my mom and against my stepdad which I love very much to the big island of Hawaii and I believe it was 1972 and I went to high school I lived with my dad part-time but eventually I lived with my friends down the street Um, and I worked through my ways of 72 73 and I graduated in 74 And prior to that, I had taken the city and county lifeguard job that my father cut out of the magazine, the newspaper at the time, and saw the tryout. And my best friend, David Kahanamoku, a son of Bunny Kahanamoku, flew to Oahu, took the bus over to the natatorium. You're going to get a kick out of this. The natatorium. Brian Kealana. Rella Sun, Teddy Bear Davis, Melvin Pu'u, Double D, David Kahanamoku, Buffalo Kealana. Wow. We're all there trying out. And there's a few other hard hitters. And Aloha Kai Eo was the superintendent. And in the water we went, down to the end of the natatorium and back. The natatorium's really dirty. What is that exactly? It's a war memorial um, up against Diamond Head. Okay. It's still there to this day. Okay. And it was an indoor, outdoor swimming pool with bleachers. Mm-hmm. And it was built in the early 20s, hmm. if I believe, and it's still there. And that's where the substation was for the city county um, lifeguard department, and that's where we did our tryouts. And that particular day, I jumped in, but the water was so dirty. I swam with my head out of the water, down and back. And when I got back, Aloha Kaeo pointed at me to get out of the pool. Just me. Meanwhile, everybody else had to do down and back, down and back. At the end of the swim, they kind of looked at me and Aloha Kaeo said, 
When you go for a rescue, you never put your head down. You swim with your head up out of the water so you can see where your guy is and you don't lose him. We became lifeguards. David and I flew back to the Big Island, graduated high school, threw everything in my VW van, put it on Young Brothers, and we were here in the early summer of 1975. I got stationed at Waimea Bay. David was at Rock Piles, and the journey began. Wow. So you're a lifeguard at Waimea Bay, and you're also surfing Waimea Bay when it's big, obviously. Then, no, I was just a greenie. I was an FNG. Okay. And, um, but I worked with Eddie. Eddie Aikau. Yeah, and um, I was exposed to the North Shore. And, you know, we only had one board back then. So one board fits all. And then as time evolved, we got three or four boards, but we shared them. I still have some of those boards that I shared with Kahanamoku. Um, and you just seem like you work way to the top. For me, I did work Waimea Bay, but it wasn't my spot. As I traveled up the coast to rock piles, to the pipeline, to Sunset Beach, I found my spot, mm -hmm. which was Sunset because there was a lot more room yeah. to move, a lot more area, not so limited like the pipe or Kewana or Waimea Bay was only when it got big. Mm -hmm. So that being said, um, I was at Sunset and fortunately um, there was a surfboard shaper across the street um, whose name was Dick Brewer. And everything just fell together from there on out um, because Brewer would come to the tower and want to shape me boards. And so we had the best surfboards in the world working at Sunset Beach. And, you know, Sunset Beach was my place, and that was where I created inventory, mm -hmm. Water Patrol. Yeah. What was what, your connection with Sunset? What was it? What was it about the wave that drew you and, and sort of spoke to you and connected with you? I liked juice. And I was surfing with the best surfers in the world. Mm -hmm. And I could go into those names, but I'm sure you know the names. And they were highly qualified watermen. And just to sit and watch them taught me vicariously so much. So I adapted to their teachings and their bottom turns and their boards. And it was just like encyclopedia of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it just was something that, you know, Paumalu, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's secretly written and it, you have to have a connection to it. Yeah. And she likes you or she doesn't like you. Um, you got to remember, um, Sometimes when you go surfing, it's the best day in your life and nothing goes wrong. And other days you go surfing and everything goes wrong. Well, Sunset Beach, she's a very jealous bitch. Mm -hmm. And she will give you all the love in the world. And then she'll turn around and bite you so hard that you'll run from, here, from her for years. Yeah. And surfers all around the world, you know, who've been coming here since the 60s and 70s, can't understand the same thing that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Watch out for her. She bites. And I mean, why me bay bites? Piahi bites, but there's nothing like Palmalu. So the, the Palmalu being sunset. So those sunset days, can you remember one of the worst sort of hold downs, wipeouts, swims? Yeah, there's many, there's three or four lineups at Waimea Bay or Sunset Beach. And mine was, I loved the spot called Behind the Hammer behind the West Peak, 40 or 50 feet. That way you could catch it behind the slingshot, do your upper turn, throw it through the peak, halfway down, do a mid-face bottom turn, run across the flat spot, set up for the inside bowl, get barreled, spit out, and paddle back out. Um, but you have to be committed. And if you sit at 10 o'clock, you can get away from it. And if you sit at 11 o'clock, you're kind of on the shoulder. You sit at 12 o'clock, you're committed. But if you sit at 1 or 2 o'clock, you are very, very in the danger zone. Mm -hmm. And when sunset gets big, you get stuck behind the hammer. You have to run towards backyards. And when backyards connects and the West Peak connects at 10 to 12 to 15 feet and you're in that area of terror, um, you find out how 
big of a man you are. Mm -hmm. And for us that play over in that area, you have to be ready to pay some serious, serious dues. And that could be punching through the lip on the first one and getting sucked over and getting the next five or six on your head before you even start to swim in. Fortunately, running with the A team and seeing Peter Cole out swim everyone, I learned that the quicker you start swimming to the beach, the farther away from the danger zone you become. Mm -hmm. But you gotta understand that all around the world, surfers know that area and they've been humbled there as I have. And they're all smiling right now because they could relate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's still there. Yeah. And as we get older, we don't go to the danger zone very much anymore. Mm -hmm. We kind of stay over at noon, 11 and 10 o'clock. Now I, I stay in a place that's, I'm going to say, um, I call it the Sakuma Bowl. It's named kind of after uh, Momo Sakuma. She's a very precise surfer from Japan. She's one of the best big wave riders that followed her heart. Hmm. And she's extremely good. Mm -hmm. And she sits in a very safe spot for a reason. And so now I sit in that area because um, at my age, it's safer. Mm -hmm. And you can catch the tail end and then through the flat spot and the inside bowl, and you can keep it relatively close. Yeah. Um, if you go to the hammer, you go behind the hammer on the North Bowl, that's a whole different monster. And that takes a lot of training, yep. a whole different surfboard. And um, I've been there. I've done that. Yep. Now it's their turn. Yep. In your, in your sort of peak hammer days, when you were totally in sync with Sunset, when you were having a session where everything was coming together, what was that like? What did it feel like? And what, what lines were you drawing on the waves? At that particular time, um, I used to love from 1 o'clock till dark. That was, those were the golden moments. And um, having watched um, surfers like Barry Kanayapuni and Reno Abalera and Hackman and Peter and Bradshaw, James Jones was just through the roof and many, many more. Al Chapman's, um, and I could go on. Watching their lines created my lines. So my favorite thing was to catch it right behind the hammer, steep as it gets, and mid-face it, mid-face turn, hand on the water, BK all the way. And of course, I'm on a board that can get you in serious trouble, brewers. And so my mid-face turn became something like James's or something like BK's where just low is pro. Mm -hmm. And then it would just slingshot you through the next spot, which on those days you couldn't make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we were on top of the moon. We were like, God. Wow. At the time I was working at Sunset Beach, um, I found this beautiful cabin at Backyards, which no one went to Backyards. That's why we named it Backyards. And God bless his soul, Flippy Hoffman. Yay, Flippy. And he was a charger, that guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he built a 60-foot board just for a wee. And uh, while I lived there, there were we paid a lot of attention to scene assessments, which look, listen, and feel. We didn't have surf line. We didn't have internet buoy readings, but we knew from Jimmy Blears um, to count the intervals between the waves hitting the beach, listening to the rumble, listening to the tr the trade winds through the trees so we could combine what was going to happen when the sun came up. My relationship with Waimea Bay was when there was a solid rumble, there were no intervals from backyards, rumble all the way down. There was no sunset. There was no white pipeline. It was Waimea Bay. So that's when I knew with my scene assessments to go to the bay. Mm -hmm. And in those days, I had some pretty good seniority on the North Shore, so I would just ask my partners at Sunset, Jimmy, Jimmy Blears, Buchu Kauka, Jim Sutar, hey, could you guys mind if I go down to Wyoming Bay? And they go, go for it. They got the beach closed and signs are up, so I'd go down to Wyoming Bay. And my relationship started 
when the outer reefs were closing out, I'd go to the bay and um, and Eddie was there a few of those days. And I remember the best advice he ever gave me was don't go to it, let it come to you. And you see that and you see this, this is where you want to be. And that's where lineups became really crucial and um, experience started growing and, and my style and my boards really fit Waimea Bay well. The pecking order was tough, but very experienced. Mm -hmm. There was very little wiping out going on from the early 70s to the middle 80s because the, the calibration of surfing was just full on professionals, mm -hmm. watermen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we earned it. Yeah. What was, okay, so you, we talked about Sunset and the Hammer uh, why Maya, what was what was the what was the thrill out there? What was the thing that you were trying to be in sync with or to achieve? It was twice as big as Sunset Beach. Um, and so the drop, it yeah. was all about the drop. If you wiped out on the drop, your your um nine hundred dollar, ten hundred dollar brewer would go on the rocks and it'd be destroyed. Uh, and it was a mid face turn, bottom turn, all the other spots in the North Shore were closed out. It was the only place to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless you went to Waimea Bay. So it was really convenient to be a lifeguard and then also be out in the lineup surfing the bay. With, and I got to say, it, it was crowded, but there was a pecking order and everybody worked together. And so we were able to surf the wave instead of around people. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot more in control and it wasn't so dangerous because the caliber of surfing was so high. Mm -hmm. Can you remember one of your best all-time waves at Waimea? I'll never forget. Don't go to it. Let it come to you. And, and I had a lot of really big days at Waimea Bay, but I think where it really came together was, um, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but was Super Bowl Sunday, 1988, on my Brewer gun. And um, um, it was 30 feet, and it was in the 80s. And there was a Green Bay Packers against the Dallas Cowboys. And it was small in the morning and everybody was having barbecues and, well, it got bigger. And as the day progressed, the game was on. And uh, everyone was watching the game rather than the ways, well, it got 20 feet, got 25 feet, got 30 feet. And Waimea was giant, 25, mm -hmm. 30 feet, closing out and, me, Mark Fu, Brad Shaw, Sumi San from Japan. There was a f Neil Napoli. There was a few of us out there that could barely get out there. Mark would go always on the first wave, and then you would see him again. Brock wasn't there that day, um, but I caught the wave of my life, which there was probably four or five people that left their homes to come down to Waimea Bay, and, and Lord and behold, I got the wave. And... Um, there was a guy from Malibu who was out there on a mat. Hmm. And you can recall the mats. They were yellow with mm -hmm. blue, and they went boop, 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 yes. boop. And yep. if you left them in the sun, one side would pop. And, of course, yep. we still used them and fought over them. But he was out on a raft. Hmm. And he got the photo, the three-photo sequence of me, um, where I flew off the top, mid-faced it, bounced a few, came around the corner. And as I came around the corner... I could hear a lot of energy going on, and I saw this mat flying through the air, and the bay closed out, and I straightened out and got mowed and swam to the beach, and um, that went around the world pretty quick with Surf Magazine and surfing and so forth. Is that that black and white one? Yeah. yeah. That's an amazing he, photograph. I think his name was Michael Grosswin. Okay. I and remember he, him, yeah. He's from Malibu, yeah. and he's a very successful contractor, I believe. He's still... In the area, and Alan's really good friends with him. God, I wish I could get a copy of that. But, you know, it, it is what it is. Maybe we can get one. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, and that was really, um, it was a, probably where my life really started picking up. Like, mm -hmm. wow, that was, I nailed it down for being um, a experienced big wave writer. Yeah. What's interesting is being, being a big wave writer at that time, what was the... Motivation, I guess, maybe not the motivation, but you could. There was no big wave tour like there is now. It was probably 
something more for love than it was for the glory and the money and the sponsors and all the rest of it, right? There was nothing involved with it. The only thing that was involved was skill, friendship, camaraderie, absolutely no money, and following your heart. And when you follow your heart, it's going to show you the way. Mm -hmm. And that opened up what's become now, which is completely different than what it was then. Mm -hmm. But that was when, of course, they were riding big waves before Uncle George Downing and Buzzy Trent and Greg Noel. I mean, there was a hardcore group at Makaha mm -hmm. and Waimea Bay, but nothing like this point of my career because the boards that James Jones and Al and Brewer and Alan Byrne were building and Pat Ross were building were just that they could get you in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were fierce guns yep. built oh. for certain areas. Yeah. Rhino, rhino chasers. They were boards that were built in proportion. Not very few were bigger than 10 feet because, you know, there was a little thing that you, you don't want to get to things that you haven't got to yet. Mm -hmm. You want to fit in. But um, that was a turning port for the shapers. In my perspective, it was hardcore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, after Waimea Bay... Yeah, just to refresh you, you were saying you got kind of bored with it and then you want, wanted to go on to the next thing. You, you know, after we were writing a lot of Waimea and um, we started getting bored with it. I mean, just go straight and turn and go straight. We loved to go to Makaha, but we had to drive. So um, at that time, there was a lot of trade winds. It was really windy. Mm -hmm. And um, we were living at backyards and just out of the blue, this pink sail shows up one day at backyards and we were kind of playing with it mm -hmm. we had there was yard birds we were the yard birds and okay. we had a couple wind boards but god it was so obsolete back then and then this pink sail shows up and we're just like groms and out the pink sail went and oh my god he went and he just turned on the first reef, and it was big, it was 10, 12 feet, 15 feet, and he just, all by himself, just annihilated these waves, and he was doing these loops and air off the tops, and we're like, oh my God, and that was it. Mm -hmm. It became known as Backyards, and the um, sailor with the pink sail was Robbie Nash. Okay. And there was something about Robbie. When Robbie showed up with the pink sail, you didn't sail with him. You went straight to the beach and watched. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you watched. Um, yard birds were born. And so did the windsurfing kind of just expand your imagination into another way of approaching the waves and another way of moving through the water? I say it sure did. You know, why paddle when you could fly? Yeah. It was like a motorcycle on water, which led to so many other things. But it was just the most... Um, educational time in our life because we had so much room and the consequences were very expensive and heavy mm -hmm. with extremely long swims. Mm -hmm. And so we all, a group of 20 of us for 15 years, we just, every day we'd go to work early, but good thing about windsurfing is you'd get off early to catch the winds. And so... Yeah. We were very adamant at the first reef, second reef, and then the third reef would take us from outside backyards all the way through the inside bowl at sunset. Wow. And then with all the power in the world, you'd just shoot it straight back out to backyards. And when you throw a jibe, you look back to the land and you find a perfect pinpoint lineup, which surfing never allowed you to do. Mm -hmm. It would take you years to get to find that spot. Mm -hmm. And so windsurfer, windsurfing allowed us not only at Backyards, but at Ho'okipa and Piahi to find that lineup on your windboard like a motorcycle. Yeah. And once that happened, you could go right to the same spot and somewhat be safe and, and ride waves, jump waves, swim in, destroy your equipment. We were creators. Mm -hmm. We were thinking of other ways to um, take 
take sports to levels of evil Knievel, you know, just mm -hmm. like, oh, we've got this. We have our big wave experience. Now we're riding these giant waves on windsurfers with foot straps and learning the outer reefs. What's next? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as time progressed, it was just Neil Pride approached us. They gave us every single toy we could ever have. We had the best boards from Jimmy Lewis. We had the best mass, boom, sales, bring it on. And for years and years, we just had a lot of fun, the Yardbirds. And Robbie, the pink sail, would come out, and we'd call sailors from Maui because backyards was like kapu. Mm -hmm. um, if you made a mistake, everything was broken. Mm -hmm. And you swam in, and you went back to Maui real quick because it was uh, way different than Hokipa. Yeah. Um, Hokipa had the wind every day where backyards only woke up and went to sleep and woke up. As time evolved, um, Kurt Carl Smith bought the lot at Backyards, which he was an avid sur windsurfer with um, Harold Iggy and Tom Peach, who lost his life windsurfing at Backyards. And, of course, I was working the day where I went and rescued him, and he died in my arms. And um, that was a turning point for me, too, um, having been through so much lifeguarding on the North Shore. And you come to a point where you've been there, you've done that, and the PTSD was really hitting me hard, and, and I wanted to move on. And God works in mysterious ways. So the wind stopped. It virtually stopped. I mean, within a year, um, the trade winds changed at an angle, went more offshore, hmm. so you couldn't get to the beach, um, very inconsistent, and um, as time evolved, the Yardbirds moved on. Oh, that's so interesting. I always thought the Yardbirds might have um, moved into kite surfing or something else. I didn't realize it was sort of a, a weather pattern thing. Well, windsurfing was all about riding the waves and riding big waves, the biggest waves. I mean, I rode 25, 30-foot waves on my windboard, and man, oh man, you didn't to the tip of the fin only in the water, mm -hmm. out of the harness, just trying to get to the beach alive. And of course, our asymmetrical boards were just like the, the Ferraris, the Mercedes-Benz of all time. But when it stopped, we kind of got to a point where we're, everyone kind of went on their way, whether it was a career or marriage or children, or, you know, other priorities. Yeah. At that point in the late 80s, I, was, I think I was with Jerry Lopez, and Tony, his wife, and we were up in Reading, I believe, and it was Mount Shasta. And Tony was going on and on about, well, you guys should try snowboarding. I mean, it's really cool, you know, and yeah, yeah, you know, that attitude. Well, one day we decided to go to Shasta. That afternoon we came back and we bought every VCR tape we could buy and every snowboard tape we could rent or buy, and mm -hmm. we went home and... And snowboarding became a huge focal point in our life. That being said, we had a really, really fantastic man. His name was Tom Flager. And Tom Flager um, owned a nonprofit called Flager Institute of Environmental Research. And we were doing these programs all over the world at the time about fossil fuels and um, global warming. And if you do this to that, it affects this. And it was called Cry Help. Of course, we went to Tavarua for years and the Mentuais for years, and we actually got to see islands sinking and snows melting and winds stopping. And um, we were up in Canada one day, and we were snowboarding, and it's just, you got to, snowboarding is the closest thing you could get. And um, it's really, really heavy run, and we got to the bottom of the mountain, and the bell went off. Wow. And so that being said, we kept it pretty quiet, and um, we ended up back on Oahu, and we called up Dick Brewer by landline and said, hey, we want to talk to you about possibly doing a project with us. And so he said, sure, come over. So we went over to his shop and said, well, this is what we want. We want a, po a board that goes from point A to B as quick as possible, and we want to put foot straps on it, like a snowboard, and like a windsurfer. And we wanted to go real fast. And so we split and came back a while back later. And there it was, Betsy. It was a swallow tip. No, I believe it was a pintail, five stringers, full concave, an inch and a half thick, foot, foot straps marked on it. And we just went, 
wow. Hmm. And that was when toe surfing started to come into play, but it took surfing big waves yeah. and being very experienced. It took windsurfing, the outside lineups, the foot straps, the technology, snowboarding. Yeah. You make a mistake, you die. We put all those sports together to create the sport of kings, mm. which was riding the biggest waves in the world on a tiny little board. And like Flippy Hoffman said, and I'm happy to share this with Surfer's Journal, by the way. Thank you. You can't get, God damn it, you can't get freight train on a bicycle. Not mass power with power. The ocean was made for pistons. And I could still see him saying that with a doobie in his mouth. Now you guys go out there and do it. And I'll watch. And so that being said, we were doing a lot of Hawaiian water patrol safety. Um, we were doing point break. Um, we'll get into that. Um, and we combined all our rescue techniques, all our highly skilled jet ski drivers. Um, I believe we did water world. And we were toe surfing at the same time. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, of course, Laird and I were invited to the Eddy. And at one point in our life that changed a lot of things was when Melvin Pu'u and Brian Kialana and Terry Ohui came to the Outer East because George Downing said, go get Derek and Laird. And they found us, but we didn't go. And they understood because it was 30 feet, southeasterly winds, peening from outside backyards all the way through Sunset Beach, no one near us. And we were riding waves for a mile and a half, two miles. And this was towing in? We were, in, we were towing. So you chose to tow in the outer reefs versus surfing in the eddy at Waimea. And it was a really tough decision because when Brian, me, and Terry, we all looked at each other and said, can you please replace us with Hawaiians? That was it. They left. Um, that point, and of course, before when people started seeing us toe surfing, it went around the world instantaneously. Hmm. And this is way before, oh my God, in Tahiti. That being said, there was a hardcore group. Me and Laird and Buzzy were hardcore. We went from the Zodiac to the jet ski, and then oh, we were really getting it on on Oahu, and people were like, this is really cool. Wow. And then there were other people going, yeah, that thing's it's cheating and stuff. But we didn't care. We had already mastered big waves. Mm -hmm. We had already mastered windsurfing, snowboarding. We were, let's keep it going. Yeah. And then the phone rang, and it's a good friend of all of ours, Gary Lopez. And I've told this before, but he said, yeah, you guys got to come over here. Maui, you got to check this place out over here. The Adam Blaster. Domes. So off we went to Maui. It took us a while to get to the cliff because it was all cane roads and muddy. And oh, okay, let's go over that wrong road. Let's go over here. And then boom, there we were and parked the car. Or I think the car got stuck and slid somewhere, but we pushed our way through the bushes down on the cliff, and there it was, top to bottom, 30 feet, spitting both ways, no one near it. This is Piahi, Jaws. This is Piahi. Then it was Piahi. It still is Piahi. Um, we named it Jaws, but it's Piahi out of respect of the, the culture and the Hawaiian culture, which yeah. is basically where everything gets drawn to. It's a beacon. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and the rest is history. What was it like pioneering? What was it like the first time that you went out? And it was really hard to understand that something so phenomenal was happening right before your eyes. It was really hard to process coming around the corner and seeing the back spray of a wave exactly the same shape as the front of the wave going 100 feet in the air. It was really hard to process pulling into the lineup and looking at this wave top to bottom 30, 40 feet and no one there. Mm -hmm. It was really hard process to go, you go. No, you go. No, you go. And so 
that being said, it, it was the, definitely the peak in our lives. Strap crew, my life, Laird, Buzzy, it was like we were climbing Everest. Mm -hmm. It was going to be the peak of our lives, and everything after that was just going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Was it scary? We were highly qualified. We were young. We were training. Fear didn't really come into play at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. I think the only thing that scared us was watching Laird on a wave to witness a 30, 40 foot wave top to bottom and to see a guy that's 220 pounds of steel cables attacking it like no other human being could attack it in full control and going so fast um, to this day it will never be the same mm -hmm. and that was what scared us mm -hmm. matter of fact that being said i think one of the ways that i told him on to i was i was really scared as you just mentioned and um that was when i said came in one of our videos that was jaws that was jaws the mm -hmm. meanest top to bottom barrel in the world right behind you and if you made a mistake you were going to get eaten alive and die mm -hmm. and that jaws thing came out the crowds came from all around the world with no skill level whatsoever yeah and we had to witness that that must I have mean, been tough and it was really tough for all of us to swallow because we were so qualified and so connected and we were cleaning the, the shoreline and we were so in love with the whole concept to all of a sudden turn into the sport of fools. Mm. And after that, the, the carnage, the crashes, the wipeouts, the equipment problems, the all aboard the crazy train. Mm -hmm. And we just gave up. Mm -hmm. What was the craziest thing you ever saw at Piahi? Uh, someone coming in from way behind and three jet skis coming in in front of him without even knowing he's coming in and three jet skis behind him. So there was probably equivalent of six or seven skis going on one wave that's 50 feet. And there's no room for mistakes. And there was very little communicating going on after certain people came to Piahi and brought their ways with them, which oh, outnumbered our ways. So that became the protocol. And that was why Piahi was so dangerous because you had 50 more of them than 10 of us. Yeah. How long of a window did you get before it turned to into the crazy train, as you described? 10 years. So you got a decade of great, incredible, massive. Incredible. And so what was your life like at that time? Incredible. I mean, I was fortunate to live here on Oahu where most of my family and friends are, but I was spending a lot of time on Maui religiously and the phone would ring. Matter of fact, that was funny. Um, I was told to buy a, a man phone, like one of those clip open phones, uh -huh. just for that reason. Uh -huh. Bring. Okay, I'll be there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, um, I won't get into management or anything, but I'm just going to say it was the best time of all of our lives, mm -hmm. the strap crew and um, our lives. We were just peaking. Yeah. And what came with it, the food and the camaraderie. And I think we documented it all on all our videos. And right now we're going through all our footage, which we own. Mm -hmm. God bless Sonny Miller and Don King. And we're trying to put all the golden moments together. And, of course, along with that came Die Another Day. And then before that came the, the days of all days at, in Tahiti. Mm -hmm. um, were you there for that? I was there for that. The Millennium Wave at Oh my God! Day, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a it was a very special time in our life. It was uh, you know, I was down there with uh, the Hui Ohe and all of the the Hui team, which is Makua Rothman and I know Thompson or I know Srat and all the little Groms, and we went over there to check out Tahiti and surf the beach breaks and stuff. And Laird happened to be over there with um, some photographers and. Um, 
Raimana and so forth. And then all of a sudden this swell came up and it really came up. And we happened to have a boat and we went out to the spot. And Laird was out there with the Oxbow team, but he wasn't hooking up. And I was on the other boat. So I called the driver over to my boat and said, on the boat. And so when I got on the ski, it was like brothers. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to worry about what he wanted or he didn't have to tell me what he, what he wanted. We just worked in conjunction. And uh, it took a while, but when finally that thing came, and he caught it. If you really look at what happened, you'll never see my ski. You'll never see my trail because we worked so hard at Piahi to keep our tracks off the face of the wave right. so the photo could be just priceless. So you whipped Laird into the Millennium Wave. Yeah. Wow. And then after that, um, I came to pick him up. and He was going through a lot of things in his life in that particular moment solved a lot of his problems in life and that was when he decided to make a lot of correct changes in his life and um sobriety was one of them mm -hmm. and yeah which We'd, was just the most unbelievable thing that anyone could do to their life is to just go sober yep uh we had laird on the podcast and he talked about that very thing have you had uh sort of big wave experiences that sort of shifted you where you came in with a different viewpoint on, uh, on your life. And I've had, um, many, but I think, you know, along our path, there was the day that, um, there was a lot of people in the lineup and there were some mixed emotions going on. And, and I showed up on a borrowed ski. I think I borrowed Jerry's ski and, um, I got into the lineup and the guy that was driving me wasn't very good. I'm Billy Kahaliao Simpson, and uh, um, I said, just go for the sun. So when the sun rises from the east, um, that's the direction you want to go. Well, he did, and um, he yanked me, and I let go of the rope, mid-faced it, and pulled in a really big barrel. And it just happened to be in front of a lot of people, and so the yellow ribbon was cut. And I went out and did it two more times in that one day, and then I left. That was a really peak experience for me and humbled a lot of people. And we ponoed together after that. And mm -hmm. then. What does pono mean? We all sat down in the group and okay. ponoed up, meaning um, if you have a miscommunication or if you have an argument. I see. Um, sort it all out. You pono up and get it on the table, you know. And so that happened. And then about a, two or three months later, there was another couple little things going on with crowds and. Um, I went to go for a right, and there were two skis in front of me, so I just kind of somehow went left. And nobody went left. And I stuck a really big, very dangerous, life-on-the-line wave, and I made it. And that was the other yellow ribbon. So those are two peak experiences in my life where I really opened the gates for others to follow. Mm -hmm. Before we jump to the present day, t tell me about uh, Point Break. So Point Break came to town, and I, I was a lifeguard at Sunset Beach, and I didn't really know much about it, but they were doing a screening where all the people went to be actors or be extras or so forth like that. And I heard a lot of guys went Mark Fu and Bradshaw and stuff like that. And there was a scene and an actor, Patrick Swayze, and, of course, um, War Child, Vince Klein, and... Um, Keanu Reeves, and you know, there was a, it was a big movie. Wow, this is pretty big. Well, anyways, we heard that it was around, but we were lifeguards. And so one night I'm at home and my phone rings landline and um, I go, hello, this is Derek. And he goes, oh, is this Derek Dorner? And I go, yeah, this is Derek Dorner. And he goes, well, who's this? He goes, oh, I'm Patrick Swayze. And I'm thinking, hmm. Okay, I didn't even flash to Dirty Dancing. Mm -hmm. I didn't flash to anything. We didn't have TV then, hardly, you know. Um, and so I go, yeah. And he goes, well, I, I want you to die for me. <laughs> and I go, well, I don't die for anybody. What's this about? He goes, well, can we meet somewhere? And I went, okay. Um, why don't we meet at Chun's Reef tomorrow at noon, and I'll be in the lineup. So 
noon, this guy paddles out. No one was with him, and he paddled out kind of sideways and mm -hmm. he got up next to me, and he's beautiful, blonde-haired, beautiful eyeballs, just sprinkling and looking right at me. He goes, hi, I'm Patrick Swayze. Maybe you know me from Dirty Dancing. And I'm like, go, yeah, that's really cool. He goes, well, I'm here to do a movie, and I want you to die for me. And I go, I told you last night, I don't die for anybody, but um, what does it entitle? And he goes, well, I want you to do my death scene at the end of the movie. And I said, sure, I'm in. So I acquired the job. I should have hired a manager right off the bat. I should have hired SAG. I should have done a lot of things that I recommend people do immediately because I kind of backdoored it. And um, I got back to our paychecks. Mm. Uh, along the way, though, it was a great experience. Um, I had an Alan Byrne gun. Mm -hmm. I had a bunch of beautiful black and yellow boards with cobra snakes on them. And I got to hang out with Patrick. And uh, I got to do, when Waimea Bay came, I got to do some stunts out there. The unfortunate part of the whole job was I wasn't able to get a storyboard and a storyboard is like a cartoon mm -hmm. book where you look at it and you could see guys doing things while well, there wasn't a storyboard. So I was just winging these wipeouts and, and they were taking toll on me. Um, they dyed my hair, Ehu blonde, which turned to pink and then they changed it and I got bubbles in my scalp. Um, I almost got beat up. There was a lot of jealous people. People didn't talk to me. There was, how'd you almost get beat up? You don't, it doesn't seem like... Um, going to places where they didn't want it to be. Okay. And mistaking you for someone else mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, but that was okay. Once they got close to me, they realized what was going on. But um, it, that all went through. It was a big buzz. There was a lot of people working, you know, Archie, Mike Electronic. It was a really, really cool concept. Vince Klein was just badass then he was the war child yeah um but they decided to go home after eight months of working in a bunch of stunts and stuff like that and nothing really happened at that point and then one night i'm just thinking and i thought well why don't we do the iron cross so i called him up the next day and said i got this idea you know and i think maybe if the the swell comes up the next day you guys can come over here and we'll do the iron cross right off my board she loved it bigelow loved it so what was the iron cross exactly when you get on a diving board and you you with your arms open okay the iron cross kind of, yeah kind of like christ on the cross here you go and so they loved the concept they drew it up on a storyboard and they came over and we had the cameras in play and we had everybody in play but i was going to be a little smarter this time and so i called up laird and i said hey you know laird i need a favor you know because i'm going to be doing this stunt when the waves come up and um, i need you to block for me okay i need you to, i need some help because i really need to focus on the wave at the time and so, yeah, Laird said, yeah, just let me know. So the day that the surf was going to come up the next day, Jimmy Blears, Jimmy Blears knew when the waves were coming up with the intervals. He knew. Okay, so everything's in play. The Conn brothers are in play. Don King's in play. And out we go in the morning. And there's the buzz is going on. And everyone knows we're coming because the cliffs are full of people and cars and Hollywood's on the North Shore. And they got camera on the road. They got a camera here. They got a three big giant movie cameras and they had the whole water patrol thing going and that was when brian kialana and them hooked up one of the turtles and made it into a safety ski so that was the very beginning of water patrol mm -hmm. that being said um, i went out and um, caught three waves um, the first one was kind of a misfire but then i got to laird and said you know i I need more help because w when you go into a stunt, you need to really be calm. And so guys were coming in on me on purpose. This is at YMA. Yeah. yeah. They were blocking me. So I said, okay, this, I'm going to let them go on waves. But when I see my wave, I'm going to let you know. And then you're going to block them. So um, the next wave came, and it was a very good wave. And I did the perfect iron cross, which was great. And 
So would you? So you took off and sort of purposely threw yourself over the falls? Yeah, I walked up on the nose and just dove off the board with my arms straight, which came out really well. Uh-huh. They loved it. It was kind of a tie-in. Mm. Uh, and before that happened, I let a bunch of sets go by. But when that wave came and that set came, I waited a few to let James Jones go because you had to let James Jones go on his way because he was James Jones. And out of respect, because he was a very good surfer and local boy. And so my wave came. I looked over at Larry and said, and Larry Jones, stop. And everyone would just stop. And so I just, phew. so the third wave came and um, it was just wide open. And it was a big wave. And I just did the iron cross off my board. And as it stated, I landed halfway down the face of the wave. I skipped twice. And then I just did the old Mark Cunningham bottom turn with my arm. Mm -hmm. And the wave just freaking pitched out over me. And I was looking up at the road and the cars and it spit back. I came on top, hardly a horrible wipeout at all. And it was a wrap. Wow. It was a wrap. Wow. So those three waves are at the very end of the movie. That's so great. You just reminded me mentioning Mark Cunningham. So you were sort of body surfing on the wave. Didn't you used to surf Waimea with a single um, swim fin tucked into your shorts? I did surf Waimea Bay with a swim fin for a reason. And um, if you've ever lost your board at Waimea Bay, it's hard to swim in. You've got the current, the white water, and, you know, you have to get into the white water to get pushed along the rocks. To yeah. get, you have to know your shit. Yeah. And if you don't come in after the river, you have to do a complete rotation around to do that again. Past the tower, you got to go out, over, and around. And, you know, after three rounds, you're freaking, yeah. you know, you're beat. Yeah. And Brock Little, if he was alive, could write a book about that because he did it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but one day I was out at Wyoming Bay, and there, Finn was in the lineup, and I just for some reason, I just grabbed it. It was a Churchill and stuck it in my pants and um, put my vest over it. And about three waves later, I lost my board. And I reached around and put the fin in. And in the amount of power that I got from with the one fin, yeah. I was to the beach so quickly through the white water, through the current. I never did it again without a fin. Wow. And I gave that fin to a lot of people hmm. to swim into the beach. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So it just stuck. Oh yeah, with that me. makes a lot of sense. Um, thinking about your your whole odyssey, I mean, and 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 I live in Malibu now, and the very breaks that you started at, I know well. I drive by them all the time when I'm home. Um, what an entirely different life you got by coming to Hawaii and the, this whole experience you've had over decades. It's so different to the one you would have had if you'd never left Los Angeles, you know, and culturally too. I mean, Hawaii is so, so different. Yeah, it's really cool. I have a, a girl surf team here that, well, not a team, but a group of girls and they dance hula and they're so Hawaiian and um, it's such a spiritual thing. We're so well connected to each other. We all love each other and we meet and we surf and then we go do our own thing. And, and then my son, you know, who's, very active at big waves and it's his generation and tiger. And then the North shore is still the most beautiful place in the world. And like everywhere in the world, change is happening wherever you're from or wherever you're listening to, you all can always see the change except for if you're in Alaska um, or the Antarctica, but it's still the most, it's the best place in the world that I live in, you know, a great, concept was I was in Malibu recuperating from a surgery that I just had and uh, I was I witnessed it I, I my first wave I went to Lachusa Point I went to zeros I went to county line and had fish and chips and I relived the whole thing with my kid and I just went we surfed it he surfed at Dukes right in front where I surfed big rocks it was just God, it was a flashback for me and Alan walking around and going, look at our sons. <laughs> and Alan was really adamant with this interview. He said, let's get it on. And he is Malibu. Alan Sarlo, yeah. And wherever I go, there's the Malibu locals that always challenge me because they they're very territorial, whether they're at 
Dukes or the Chart House or Latigo. Or it's like, okay, but, oh, oh, you're from Lechusa Point? Oh, you know, oh, oh, yeah, he's, he's a local boy. Somewhat I still am after being gone for 50 freaking years. Yeah. But it was really a good thing to visit. And I will revisit it, but I was sure glad to get home in the country. Yeah. And I would not live anywhere else in the world. And, and I love my family and my friends and just got to make the right choices in life and keep it going. Yep. Thank you, Derek. Aloha. Soundings is brought to you by The Surfer's Journal and is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Our theme song is Give Me a Wave by Asuka Matsumiya and Paz Lenchanton. The Surfer's Journal is a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from FCS, Finisterre, Howler Brothers, Outer Known, Patagonia, Rainbow Sandals, Vans, and Yeti. The journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to visit surfersjournal.com and subscribe. This episode of Soundings is presented by Costa Sunglasses, the badge of the explorer. For over 40 years and counting, Costa has remained steadfast in their dedication to not only crafting the most durable, functional, and long-lasting eyewear, but in protecting our waterways and natural resources. Whether you're on the back deck scanning for yellowtail, eyeing a set swinging wide at an empty point, camped out on a bluff at the end of a rotted two-track, or anywhere and everywhere in between, Costas are built to help you see what's out there. Head over to costadelmar.com today to find just the right pair for you, no matter where the water takes you. Thank you for listening to Soundings, and until next time.